Thank you. So the brain is a very important structure in the body. It's very hard to get along in life without one. The brain is the seat of learning, thought, emotion, motor control, sensory processing. It, it makes life uh, possible for us. And it processes a very large amount of information. And it does th so through a vast network of cells. It's estimated that there are about 100 billion neurons in the brain. And each neuron has connections with thousands of other neurons. So it's a very big network. And partially because it's so big, very little is known about how information gets processed, about how information flows between different regions, between different neurons, about how different areas interact with each other. But such an understanding could have significant implications for basic neuroscience, for improvements in medical research, such as in diagnosing and treating uh, mental illnesses, in developing improved uh, brain-machine interfaces, and motor and sensory neural prosthetics, and just a whole bunch of cool science. But trying to understand how billions of neurons interact with each other is a tough problem. So for now, let's consider a little bit simpler problem where we have two neurons. And we have recorded their activity patterns. The neurons communicate through sequences of what are called spikes. They're voltage changes that have roughly characteristic shapes and durations. And so you can think of the information that gets communicated is done so through the timing of these spikes. So you can have a, a time series of when there was a spike or when there wasn't. So if you look at these two time series for the neurons X and neuron Y, uh, and you stand back a little bit, you might be led to, you might be tempted to infer that there's some relationship between them. That it seems that when X is active, Y is not. And when y is active, x is not. But it's not immediately clear whether that's x's activity suppresses y's, or y's silence induces activity in x, or maybe they're not related at all, or they're both influencing each other. This is a question that we would like to be able to answer, uh, particularly in a large scale with the whole brain, but even on small neural circuits. Now, for small, certain cases, neuroscientists can go in and they can do experiments to conclude physically whether one neuron has, can influence another neuron. But it can be very time expensive and difficult to do, and only with certain organisms. Now, we can record from hundreds of neurons simultaneously. We can get these time series. And we would like to have some technique for looking at these time series and then making inferences about how the neurons influence each other. Now, fortunately, a Nobel laureate named Clive Granger in economics 40, year ago, 40 years ago proposed a framework for statistical causality between processes. And his definition is based on statistical prediction, where you have two time series, x and y, and you say that x statistically causes y if we're better able to sequentially predict y using its own past than the past of x, then if only the past of y was known. So even if you know the past of y, if x still contributes some new information, then in a statistical sense, it's said to influence y. Now, when he originally proposed this framework, he developed a linear regression modeling description for that to quantify it. And while this has been widely adopted in economics, the social sciences, and biology, for our problem, it would not be useful. Researchers have shown that when you have binary time series, that linear models are not good ways of modeling them. And so we would like, but the definition is general. It can be applicable to any modality. And so we want to generalize it in such a way that we still capture the essence of it, but we have a formulation uh, quantification that we can take time series of any types of processes and do this inference. 
And so let's consider a general statistical prediction problem where we have two predictors. One will predict y at time i using only the past of y. And the other will also have access to the past of x. And to keep the prediction general, we'll operate on leaf spaces. So it's not just assigning a single value in the prediction, but leaves on all the possible outcomes. And we'll assume for the time being that we know the underlying statistics. So these distributions are the true conditional distributions. Since we're dealing with distributions, we'll use log loss as a loss function, which is a very common one to use uh, in this context, and has uh, interpretations in data compression, gambling and portfolio theory, and other areas. And if we look at the cumulative expected regret, and this means that how much the predictor who only used the past of y regrets not having also used the past of x in prediction, then we can write it as the expected value of a sum of log likelihood ratios on the conditional distributions conditioning on the past of y and the past of x compared to just the past of y alone. And this quantity is an information theoretic quantity known as directed information, which is the expected log likelihood ratio of the probabilities of the future of y given the past as shown. And it can be written in terms of the sum of mutual informations. Now, directed information, most of you might be familiar with something called mutual information, which statistically is a correlative measure. And is similar in the sense that if you replace past of x with the whole x series, then it becomes mutual information. But mutual information is only correlative. It can't capture whether one process is, is influencing another. Whereas direct information fitting within this framework of Granger causality can. And some important properties are that it's non-negative. It's zero if and only if the future of y is independent of the past of x given the past of y for all time. And also, with this description, it's applicable to any modality, that for general processes, you can define this, which is great. And it has been recently characterized to play a number of important roles in communication with feedback, prediction with causal side information, control over noisy channels, and a number of other areas. So going back to our original question, so we have these two neurons and their time series, but we do not know the underlying statistics. So we can't directly compute the direct information, so we'll try to estimate it. And some ways to go about this is to use a plug-in estimator, where we first try to estimate the underlying distribution and then directly calculate the direct information. But plug-in estimators often have very poor convergence results. We could try to use a universal estimator. And there, in fact, is was recently proposed a universal estimator for directed information based on context weighting trees. But unfortunately, it has very slow convergence properties and is computationally intensive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to use a parametric model, but a class of models that's general, much more general than linear regression models and assume Markovicity to get convergence results. And the class of models that we use is known as generalized linear models, which is a flexible parametric class. And the negative log likelihood can be written in this form of a sum, where the lambdas correspond to what you can interpret as conditional intensity functions, or the propensity for y to spike in the next time interval given the full history, where the history here would be the past spiking of x and the past spiking of y. And delta is a time interval. And the log likelihood, the log lambdas can be written as uh, order regressive sums, where for if you're only using the past of y, it's just a sum of the past recent y's. But if you also use x, then you can write it as a function of past x's. But here we would just use Dexes themselves. And now, if uh, if we assume stationarity, 
and the Markovicity such that for some j and some k, we can write this term as a general function g, parameterized by theta. Then by the law of large numbers for Markov chains, we can get convergence to the expected value of that function. But, and we also don't want, but we don't want to assume a priori what the model orders are for the Markovicity. So we learn that through model order selection technique known as minimum description length, which here corresponds to adding a penalty for the complexity of the model. And then picking the model orders with this total complexity minimized. And then going back and picking the maximum likelihood estimate uh, parameter set. And if we do that, we can form an estimator for the directed information as follows. And this is just a sketch of the proof, but in short, we can get almost sure, with some uh, mild assumptions, we can get almost sure convergence to the directed information rate. And so we wanted to test this out, this procedure. And so we developed a simulated data set where we have six, uh, we have six neurons. And we generated s the data sequentially. So at time i, we decide whether A spikes or not based on its own past, but not, not including the past of others. Whereas we generate data for F at time i using its own past, and also considering the past of C and the past of D. So the arrows you can think of as planned influences for the network. And when we applied the procedure, we obtained this graph, where I show all of the non-zero directed information estimates. And if you look carefully, the thicker arrows I drew to correspond to the original graph. And the thinner arrows are all extra or spurious influences that were picked up. Now, the, these extra edges can all be explained through indirect influences, such as there's an arrow from B to F. And that can be explained because B influences D, D influences F. But when you only look at B and F, you pick up that there is some influence. And we also applied this to a neural data set which was we obtained from some collaborators, where there were 37 neurons. And we, we estimated direct information between all pairs of neurons. And we picked up this graph. And here I don't show any of the weights just for visual <laughs> purposes. But these are all the non-zero estimates. And this result was very promising because it strongly corresponded to data that they had observed in that if you look, there's a strong structure along that diagonal. And in some of their experiments, they had observed that there were waves of synchronous activity propagating along those directions. In the same, and these are the same recordings, which is very promising because that suggests that there's a connection between how information flows on a regional level in this area and on a local level. And on top is just a diagram of the synchronous activity. So now, as I mentioned with the simulated data set, we picked up a number of influences that were not in the generative model, that were indirect. And so the natural question is, is there a way to address this problem? Such as if I have three neurons, x1, x2, and x3, uh, on the left-hand side, suppose that x1 influences x2, x2 influences x3. If you only look at x1 and x3, there might be some residual influence. So you might say that x1 influences x3. Or relatedly, if x1 influences x2 and x1 influences x3, then there might be some influence that's picked up because they have a common parent. And there are other cases, but these are two simple ones. 
And now I cheated a little bit when I gave Granger's definition in that I tailored it to the two process case. His original proposal for statistical <laughs> causal influences was that we say that x of t is statistically causing y of t if you're be able to predict y using all available information, including the past of x, then if the information apart from x had been used. So his original definition does incorporate other processes. And so for example, if you have three neurons, or three processes, x, y, x, y and z, but the same question, you want to ask if, y, if x is influencing y, but you have this extra process z, and you don't know what role it plays. Maybe it, influ it influences them both, or it acts as a mediator between them. Then you can condition, you take the direct information that we had before, and you can add conditioning on the past of z in the numerator and the denominator, which can be written as a sum of uh, more conditional mutual functions as before. And if you do this, then you in fact can correctly pick out which influences are direct and which ones are spurious or indirect. And when we, we applied it to the simulated data set, we removed almost all of the indirect influences. Uh, there are two left between E and F, but the values of them were are very small and could be considered statistically insignificant or possibly just due to noise. And we also applied this to the experimental data set that we had. But unfortunately, when you to do the computations for the causally conditioned direct information, it becomes more and more expensive the more you condition on. And so we're only able to do it for small cases, but we were able to remove some spurious influences. And so thank you. Any questions? So for A and F. Or, or yeah, whatever example you want. Okay. Uh, so for, uh, we could say F. So what you do is you ask A influences F. And in principle, you can condition on all the past of all the other neurons, all the other processes. Uh, but it turns out you only need to condition on those that have pairwise influences to it. Um, and we, we did it to save on computation time. We did it sequentially where we first looked at the arrows going into C, where there are two of them. And so we first looked at direct information from A to C causally conditioned on E, and then E to C causally conditioned on A. So in the general case, so the two, the simple case I was suggesting where two, you record two neurons. Mm -hmm. So we assume that physically they might not even be connected. There could be lots of neurons that are interacting with them in different ways. And in a sense, and short of throwing up our hands and saying that we can't for anything unless we know all of the activity of all the neurons, uh, we only consider influences that are statistical in the predictive sense. So only within the context of what we know. Yeah. But it is a very important question because it could, if you start to consider more and more, 
process. Like it, with the pairwise, we made mistakes. Well, not mistakes, but we picked up uh, indirect influences. And so the more you consider it, could change what you had found previously. So it is an issue, but. general, we have not characterized the convergence rate. For, uh, we haven't uh, characterized how much data you do need. For the neuroscience, we used a very large amount of data and then did some t statistical tests afterwards to check if the values were significant or not. Okay. Um, but in general, I guess it depends on uh, the type of model that you choose. Like, so we would use the generalized linear models, but we're dealing with binary data. And the data, neural data tends to be sparse. And so you do need, like we had to use a lot of data to get good fits. Okay. Um, but it definitely depends on what types of processes and what types of models you're using. So these are time series. So you'll stick a wire into a brain, and you'll record for some amount of time. And usually, the the spiking pattern that I showed you before was on the millisecond resolution. So if you record for one second, that's a thousand data points. And so for the data set that we used, it was over, I think, about an hour. But so you can, it's not, it depends on the experiment as to how long you're going to record, but it's not too hard to get lots of data points. Any other questions? Well, thank you.